There you go. Good evening. This is the December 20th, 2016 school committee meeting. And unfortunately, not, not being familiar with this room, we <laughs> neglected, we thought we were recording this meeting um, all along, and we realized about midway through here that we did not have the um, cameras rolling. So we apologize for that. We're just going to recap a couple of key important things that we think are important for people to be aware of, and then we'll continue and proceed with our meeting. Um, there's one uh, topic that came up during public speak, and that was with regard to a public statement um, um, regarding the legalization of marijuana. Uh, the East Hampton School Committee is, has had some concerns about um, the effect on our young people in our city of the passing of the um, legalization of marijuana and how that could affect the young people in our city. And as a result, we've drafted a letter that we're going to share with the City Council tomorrow evening. Um, that would be Wednesday at 6 p.m. during their, their public speak portion of that meeting. And we're going to read our letter and turn it over to them for their consideration. And Chuck McCullough was here and he notified us that um, they plan to do the same, that they have similar concerns, and they've also written a letter and we'll be sharing that tomorrow evening as well. And it, potentially also another group of parents. We're not 100% sure about Chuck's that. Chuck's letter was from Williston. And Chuck's letter, I'm sorry, is from Williston, right, representing the Williston community. Um, so, in other information that's really, I think we, we feel important to share publicly, um, we dis the committee has dis discussed previously and decided that it may be very it would be very helpful to reaffirm and share our district's commitment to provide a respectful, safe, and inclusive envir environment for all. And with that in mind, we prepared a statement that we wanted to share publicly. And I had asked Marissa if she would be willing to read that statement for everyone. So Marissa, will you read it again? I will, thank you. Thank you. So this statement is our reaffirmation of values and vision for East Hampton Public Schools. The East Hampton School Committee has been made aware of concerns at local, state, and national levels about the effects of the unusually divisive election on school climate. We would like to take this occasion to continue to promote the values of our district. As a committee, we reaffirm our district's long-standing commitment to welcome, protect, and nurture all students, and we reject all forms of discrimination, bigotry, or bullying toward any person based upon race, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, national origin, disability, citizenship, political views, socioeconomic status, veteran status, or immigration status. We take seriously our profound responsibility to offer a safe and inclusive environment for students and families of all identities and experiences. We are proud of the respectful learning communities that exist in our schools, and we continue to expect that all members of the school community treat each other with civility, compassion, and respect for differences. We remain committed to our mission to encourage students to grow in mind and character so they may fully meet academic, social, and civic expectations as educated, respectful, and justice-minded citizens. For any member of our community who may have questions or concerns, we, your teachers, principals, superintendent, and school committee are ready to help. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Next on the agenda, we um, just need, we don't need to vote to approve, but we need to acknowledge the receipt of the works minute, minutes from our work session on December 15th, that they have been submitted, and is everyone um, in agreement that they reflect our meeting yes. ad accurately and adequately. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, Superintendent Fallensby, you have a report for us. Yes, I do. Um, our Director of Curriculum, Julianne Levin, is with us this evening. And uh, I know the uh, school committee had requested um, earlier in the fall when we did a preliminary uh, presentation on our data from our, our park assessments that we that you would like to see a, a more comprehensive um, presentation uh, at, at a later date. So um, Julianne is uh, ready to do that for us this evening and I'm going to turn the uh, meeting over to her. Thank you. Um, so this is a PowerPoint presentation that I prepared for the upstairs room, um, <laughs> but uh, we're going to look at it on paper instead, which will also be just fine. Yeah, probably fair, actually. Yes, that's a good point. All right. Um, 
so there's a lot of information on the slides, but I'm just going to walk you through um, the, the conclusions that we've come to as a district in terms of um, what we're really proud of and also um, what we still see as our challenges um, that, we're, that we're seeking to improve upon. Um, so just as a, as a starter, I thought I'd give you a refresher or maybe an introduction into um, the Massachusetts accountability system. Um, it has a lot of ins and outs and it's very interesting. Um, it's, uh, it's got a great intention and um, unfortunately there are some smaller school districts that, um, that don't see the benefits of its intentions as well as the larger school districts, which is what it's really designed for. Um, and so there are some there's some pieces of this that where we'll see this is why it doesn't as well adapt to East Hampton as a smaller district but works really well for Worcester and um, Austin Public so we'll go through that as we go through the, um, the slides uh, so the first slide the purpose of the Massachusetts um, accountability system in 2011 uh, with the um, approval of the new Massachusetts frameworks in English language arts and mathematics um, we also had a new accountability system that was implemented. And that accountability system set as a goal for all school districts in the Commonwealth um, that we would reduce our proficiency gaps um, by half by 2017. So starting with our 2011 um, accountability, we were supposed to, from 2011 to 2017, cut our proficiency gap in half. All, all school districts, that's true for. That was going to be measured in two ways. Um, the first way is around student growth. So no matter how low your students are performing, you want to see your students grow, and you get a certain amount of points for watching that student growth. Um, the other way is in student, uh, I'm sorry, school percentiles. So we, we have the growth measure, achievement and growth measure, and then we have the percentile measure. And the percentile measure measures each school against like schools in the Commonwealth. So our schools get measured against schools not like the Worcester and Boston Public schools, but a lot of other schools in this area, for example. Um, our elementary schools, if you go into um, the school and district profiles on the DESE website, which is where all of the raw data is housed, if anyone is interested in looking at it, it's fascinating. Um, but you can go ahead and look at all of the raw numbers if you'd like on the school and district profiles. Um, and in there, there's a tool that shows, uh, it's called the DART analysis tool. Um, in there, there's a tool that shows which schools we are compared with when they look at our school percentiles. Um, so all of that data is there. I'm just giving you some, some, uh, some quick bites of it, okay? Which are the four or five schools that we're most often compared with? Um, in this area, it's, it's all the ones right around us. So Northampton, Amherst, um, Hampshire Regional, Gateway, it's like it's it's everything kind of right around us. We're fairly typical in this area for the other schools in our area that are also sort of typically sized. Um, grade span is another piece that they that they compare us by. So, for instance, like in this district, our um, middle school has sort of an unusual grade span, um, and so we're that that's one that doesn't get compared as easily to the other schools in this area. Um, which is interesting, but our high school, for instance, is compared very easily to Northampton High School. That's, that's one that we get compared to. Um, so those are the two things that we're compared by. Our PPI, which is our Progress and Performance Index, which is that student growth and achievement piece, and then the school percentiles. Um, there was one change in the data this year, and that was the inclusion of a new subgroup that um, the Commonwealth is reporting on called the High Needs Subgroup. And the High Needs Subgroup includes economically disadvantaged students, which is what we used to call um, our free reduced lunch students, but um, they are now referred to as economically disadvantaged, and it's a slightly different formula than free and reduced lunch. Um, our students with disabilities and our current and former English language learners, they're all grouped together in a high needs subgroup, so that where school districts don't have enough students to make um, a subgroup statistically significant, so for instance, we as a district don't have a lot of current and former English language learners, so in some of our smaller schools, we don't get data on how those students have done, but when combined with students with disabilities and economically disadvantaged students, that subgroup becomes large enough to be statistically significant, and thus we do get data from it. So it actually helps out the smaller districts in terms of getting data for students that we really should be targeting for additional um, interventions. Can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. So the economically disadvantaged students, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, 
that group that's now identified by a mm -hmm. specific formula, would that represent a smaller portion of the students that are eligible for free and reduced mm -hmm. lunch? Would it be a small, is it a more defined group or is it a broader group? Or yeah, it's actually a broader group. Okay. Um, we, it's a slightly broader group. It's, it's slight for our district. In other districts, oh, sorry. In other districts, they did see a change in um, how many students it included, but always, always broader, trying to, trying to give assistance to more children, not fewer. All right, um, so the next slide. Our district accountability and assistance levels. As a district, we're classified as level three. Um, what that means is that because the state wants to um, have a specific uh, spotlight on where uh, school districts need intervention, they always take the classification of the lowest performing school in the district. So in this case, um, our three elementary schools and our high school are all level one, which we should be extremely proud of. Mm -hmm. um, our middle school, we, are, um, we still have some challenges there, and I'm gonna go into some of the um, reasons why one very small piece is the grade span issue. Mm -hmm. So we have an unusual grade span in our middle school, which really does us, um, does us a deficit on our accountability level, which is unfortunate. Um, so our middle school is our level three school, and um, that's our targeted assistance school in terms of our accountability. Um, but as a district, we get classified as level three to make sure that we do get that assistance from the state for, in this case, our middle school. Uh, the next slide. The Actually, first. could I just oh, add yeah. this to the? Absolutely. Because <laughs> I'd love to know what extra assistance we get from the state by the level. Yes. That's no, I, actually, my, my question was just, I, I just think it's important because of the way information is reported, and I know that with the recording tonight, this may not get out as clearly, but a district mm -hmm. that had five schools, as we did, that all were level two, mm -hmm. would be rated better. Correct. Than we are. Yes. Um, and, and I don't know whether that's mm -hmm. true or not. I haven't done the research recently. I'd be curious to see whether that was true, but the... The mechanism of essentially tagging a school district that has multiple schools with one school, which may be an outlier mm -hmm. for reasons mm -hmm. that, that we can explain, um, and even within that school mm -hmm. may be tagged at that level because of an additional yes. outlier. Correct. To color the whole district that way, I'm surprised that there's not more objection to this. I mean, technically, we're a 1.4 mm -hmm. level school, right? Mm -hmm. If you add up the numbers and divide by mm -hmm. five, mm -hmm. we're, we're 1.4, yet another school Correct. district right. that was across the board twos mm -hmm. yes. would be tagged as being superior. People, and, you are absolutely right. You right. So why is that Why is that not <laughs> challenged more regularly? And who in the, who in the district can right. carry forward that, that idea? I assume hmm. that somewhere somebody decided that this was perhaps in order to be punitive, um, which I think well, you know, we're gonna to speak to in other ways, to, right. tag, to tag a district with their lowest performing school and say you may be doing really wonderfully well, but if you have one school that's not doing well, we're gonna color your whole district with a lower number mm -hmm. than you know, yeah. an average. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me, and I think in the eyes of the public, it communicates something that's not accurate. Agreed. Mm -hmm. And was it at one time done that way for so that the, those particular schools could get the assistance. And That's then, right. And then that led me to my question, where's the assistance? Right, so I mean the way, the reason it makes sense sort of on a philosophical level is that um, like in this case, our middle schools are level three school, right? But our middle school gets students from our elementary schools, right? And so the, the idea of making it the entire district, and I'm not saying I agree with this idea, I'm just saying this is this is a way to look at it that it makes sense, is that because of the assistance we're getting as a district, we can use those resources even in our level one elementary schools so the students that are being sent up to our middle school are better prepared for a middle school education. And so there is some logic to coloring the entire <coughs> district in that lower number, um, but I agree with you, it's flawed. Mm. Well, and in a world where we're not Thinking of education through competition <laughs> models, right. it doesn't matter if these if, if these ratings are designed mm -hmm. to then produce assistance programs at the state that improve right. schools. Then these aren't like scarlet letters or something. Right. But because we're now in this place where we're both having the accountability to the state and also trying to prove to our public that our schools right. are adequate when when That's faced with competition. Yep. Um, th yeah, there's that distance. That it's, it's really. But right. you go to realtor.com. Right. And the line right. is. 
you know, what's the rating of the school district? And they yep. would, I imagine, under some algorithms, just use the convenient objective yeah. number issued by the state. And so a, a, a new yep. family moving into the valley looks yes. at five communities and says, well, there's a level three academic mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. and, and yeah. makes a decision about where to buy a home yeah. and, and, and other things. It just seems it's to me misleading. to be... Yeah, the, the, there's got to be a, there's got to be a way to sure. accomplish yeah. the mission of acquiring the the, the support right. without having to suffer the, the suffer the other yeah. the other consequences. So Julian, just yeah. back to um, Thanks. Thanks. Can I borrow your pen? Mayor Karen's Sorry. comment. Uh -huh. um, so how, what exactly do we get for additional the assistance? assistance? Yeah. Sure. Um, uh, do you want me to answer that now, or do you want me to wait until the slide that answers that? Oh, okay. oh curiosity. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> it's, like it's in there. Okay. I can jump ahead to it. But no, 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 no. Want to just keep going? Okay. Yeah. When we get to that, I promise I will point it out and ask for any additional questions okay. on it. Okay. All right. Um, so the next slide is the school percentile. Um, so when we're talking about levels one through five, um, levels one and two are um, all assigned are assigned to all schools that hit the 20th percentile and above. So remember there are those two measures. There's the growth and achievement measure and then there's the as compared to like schools measure. The as compared to like school schools measure is the percentile. So any school that's in the 20th or above percentile is going to be a level one or two school. Any school that's in the level 19th or below percentile is three, four, or five. Within those two groupings of the above 20 percentiles and the below 20 percentiles, what tags you as either level one or two in the above 20th or in the three, four, or five below 20th is how fast your students are growing. So, the, so I'm gonna start using the acronyms. <laughs> the PPI is what tells us if you are one or two above the 20th percentile and the PPI tells us if we're three, four, or five in the below 20th percentile. So what we know about our schools is that our three middle schools and our high school are all above the 20th percentile. And again, if you want to know the exact percentiles, they're all on school and district profiles. The elementary schools. The elementary schools. And um, if you want to know any of that data, it's on the school um, district profiles. If you so we know that they are in level one because they are above the 20th percentile and because they have high growth of students. So they've gotten both of those measures um, under control. In Whitebrook, our level three school, we are in the 16th percentile. That one I know by heart. <laughs> we're in the 16th percentile at Whitebrook, but we're level three, not four or five, because our growth is still high. So and you'll see later in the Whitebrook slide, um, our students are all improving, but they're all, the, the state terminology is improving below the target. So we have high growth across the board. It's our percentiles that put us either in level one um, or two, but we don't have any level twos this year, um, or level three, four, or five. So that's the, that's the big news on the um, percentile. Um, the next slide is the PPI. And so that, that slide just goes into more detail about what uh, indicators go into the PPI. Um, so for the uh, for elementary schools, there are five core indicators. Um, the ELA scores, math scores, science scores, and then SGP, which is student growth percentile in both math and ELA. Not in science because they don't take science every year, and so you can't measure growth. Okay, so those are the five indicators in our elementary and our middle schools. In um, high school, they add two more indicators to the PPI, the annual dropout rate and then the cohort graduation rate. So we do very well in all of those, which is why we're a level one high school. Um, you can also get extra credit um, in your PPI. And um, in all three of our elementary schools and our uh, high school, we did get extra credit. And the extra credit comes in from both pulling kids up out of the warning or needs improvement categories and pushing kids up into the advanced category. And we did all of those things in this past year. Um, we both pulled kids up and we also pushed kids higher. So kids who used to be proficient are now advanced, um, which I think is 
really mark something that's, um, that's strong about our district, that we're not just paying attention to the kids who need that intervention because their needs improvement or failing or warning, but we're also really targeting the kids that need to be pushed up into those upper levels, which is really exciting. It's huge. It's huge. <laughs> we got a lot of extra credit for that, so that was good. <laughs> um, we also we also get um, extra credit because we demonstrated some great growth for our um, English language learner students um, on the access test. So that was also really good news. Um, and we also re-engaged dropouts, which means that kids who um, dropped out of school were then brought back into our district. And as long as you have at least two kids do that in a school year, you get extra credit for that. And East Hampton High School did that in the last year. So and I think we do need to. Um, uh, send some praise towards our high school principals, both uh, our former high school principal and our current high school principal, because they've worked very hard to do that, to make sure that uh, no students drop out, or if there are dropouts, to re-engage them. They've done an excellent job with that. Yeah, yeah, that's all good news. All right, so the next graph um, shows, this is the reducing proficiency gaps by half um, graph. So what this shows is, in 2011, our um, CPI, so Composite Performance Index, which is, which is how, it's the score kids got on the test. That's the best mm -hmm. concise way to say it. Um, and it's one of the indicators in the PPI. Um, and so in 2011, our um, CPI was 76. To reduce by half means that by 2017, so this year of testing, um, we should be up to 88. Last year's of testing, last year of testing, we were at 77.2, meaning we are improving. We've been steadily improving, just not as fast as the state would like us to. Um, so that's, oh, and so is that is that just an arbitrary uh, determination? What's the educational rationale behind saying reduce it by half in five years? Mm. Other than that, it's convenient math and it convenient sounds good math. on the political spectrum. But there's no there's no educational rationale for that. I mean, the educational rationale. I'll show you in another graph. I think that there's some educational rationale around, um, no, I, I can't even, I, I was gonna. I mean, beyond saying, that we yeah. want, beyond saying that we want our students to do better, and I don't know of a, yeah. of, of a teacher around who isn't trying to reduce the gap between their strongest performing students right. and the students who aren't performing well, to, to say to a district that, that is improving in reducing that gap, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess we'd love, we'd love to see it go to 100. Right, um, and I think, so the plan is, uh, from the state's perspective, is um, the, to continue reducing by half. So what I was gonna say, there's a, there's a little bit of logic here around um, when No Child Left Behind was passed, a lot of the pushback on it was that it required 100% proficiency, and a lot of educators thought that was crazy. Um, that's not, it's not rational to think of that. And so this was sort of the compromise of that. We don't have to get 100%, but we have to cut by half every five years. And so wherever we are at the end of this testing year, our next goal will be to cut whatever that is by half to 100. So, right, everyone wants to continue improving, but we also want to be, um, rational about well, and the standard by that. which that gap is made we're, we're assessing all those students mm -hmm. from the upper to the lower end yes. against the same standard correct not taking into account any distinguishing circumstances that would say that educationally it would be appropriate to evaluate the academic progress and the academic development of different people differently if well, they start out with different circumstances. And that's why the student growth percentile is part of the formula, and it's not just around achievement, which I think is really important in the formula. It's not just, did you get a 75 on the test? It's, did you get a 75 on the test, and on the last test you got a 45, right? That's growth, that's something we want to applaud. Um, and so the state has given us a way with the, SG, the student growth percentile to applaud that, um, that growth. Right, so, so there is a little bit of that, but it's both, which is why we have both the PPI and the percentile. The percentile is the, these are the numbers and this is where you fall. The PPI is, this is how you've grown. So we are measured by both. Um, should I go to the next slide? No. Okay. All right, so now we're getting into just the, um, the actual schools data. Um, 
So Center and Pepin are both level one. Um, they're, so with Center and Pepin, they're level one because they were held harmless this year. And held harmless means that we elected as a district to, um, to try out PARC. Um, and especially at Pepin, we also chose to do the PARC test on the computers. Um, to, and I think that this was, by the way, a very wise choice because we are mandated to take MCAS 2. Point, the next generation MCAS on the computers in grades four and eight this year. And it is excellent that our kids have had practice and moreover, that our teachers and our schools have had practice at administer administering these tests um, on the computer. We, um, we did a very detailed analysis of the data of the students um, who took the, the test on computers last year and compared it to both, so we, the two classrooms at Pepin took it on computers. Um, we compared it to the third grade data, so the same students, how they achieved in third grade and then how they achieved in fourth grade on the computers as well as comparing it to the other fourth graders who took it with paper and pencil. And we found that there was no statistical difference in the students who took it paper and pencil versus the students who took it on computers. And there was no statistical difference between how the students performed in third grade and then in fourth grade. So the, we talked a lot at the fourth grade level of why that's true. And I think it's because as a district, we've really made a push to have students have technology access in the um, classrooms. And so they've had that practice. They know how to use the computers. They know how to use their trackpads on the laptops. And so that's really good news for moving forward that our students are already digitally literate in terms of taking this assessment. I think schools um, that didn't have that practice last year are, are in for a surprise this year and they will not be held harmless next year. So that was something that was really good for us. Um, regardless of being held harmless, our CPI um, was high enough that we would have been level one anyway. I did that math just to make sure that um, we still would have been there. We still would have been there. Would have been fine. We're, we are still way above the 20th percentile in both schools. Um, the student growth was great. So we were held harmless. We don't know exactly what the state would have told us, but we have reasonable assurance that that was what was happening. Um, literacy curriculum. Oh, and this is also, I also wanted to mention um, that we are in year three of implementing a new literacy curriculum, and we've seen um, a lot of growth in our literacy assessment data. Um, for, for years now, the students have been outperforming in math in the elementary schools, and, uh, and the math uh, literacy gap is closing. So um, that's really good news. Uh, the next slide is Maple Elementary School, um, also a level one school, which is amazing because they've jumped two levels in two years, and that means that both they got out of being below the 20th percentile and they have very fast growth in their students. So we should be very proud of this little school. Um, we did get a lot of extra credit at Maple specifically for pushing kids into the advanced level from the proficient level. Um, so some good things are happening there. Um, they have been using a lot of inclusive practices at Maple, so I think that that's, that's part of it is that really um, helps improve teachers' instructional practices to have all students in your classrooms. Um, and they've also been really putting um, an emphasis on their math curriculum and making sure that it's rigorous enough um, to meet the standards. Um, both, all of that has been happening within pilot programs where they've been very attentive to collecting data and making sure that they're doing what works for students. And that will continue to happen. Um, so that next graph, East Hampton Elementary Schools, um, I'm sorry, it's very small. What I really wanted to point out to you is that those blue bars are the all students um, at e for each school and at each content uh, level. And the, the state <laughs> target for CPI is 75. And so if you look at that blue bar across the board, both ELA and math, we're hitting 75 and above. Um, the red bar is that high needs um, group of students and we are closing, especially at Maple, if you look at those first two, yeah, we're really closing the achievement gap there with our, with our high-need students. Um, and we're working on it everywhere else. Uh, at Pepin, again, even with the high-needs subgroup, it's not statistically significant enough to give us data, which is why those bars are missing from the, um, the graph. So it's because right. there are too few students <laughs> that the, their scores are not put up for compared to, and that's, is that also for the economically just, Advantage yeah, at center. center. That's correct. Yep. yep. 
we just don't have quite enough. And, and, and this is only grades three and four. If you looked at the whole school, we'd have plenty of kids, unfortunately, plenty of kids in those categories. But if, since we're just looking at third and fourth grade, and since we're a small district, we just don't get the data um, because it's not statistically significant. So this is one of those ways where we're a small district, we don't get as much data as the larger districts do um, for those subgroups. And so it's harder to analyze the data and then really do those targeted interventions. And Julia, you can yeah. talk a little bit more about the inclusive <coughs> practices and, and what this data shows us about maple and, and uh, you know, our, our focus this year. And I will. That's coming up. It's coming up. It's coming up. Yep. Well, yeah, I, I guess, <laughs> and I don't want to delay us too much, enough, but I think, and it, I think it would be great to figure out how to, to emphasize the point, but when you look at the growth over the last two, well, first of all, I'll make a side note about inclusive practices at Maple. My, perhaps they went away for a period of time, but when my eldest son, uh, 11 years ago, was entering the public school system, one of the things that struck us most powerfully about the experience at Maple, and one of the reasons that we were most excited to have him attend uh, Maple was how, um, you know, I still, get teary-eyed at the class practices that I witnessed when we were observing before Cooper joined the school and inclusion was at the heart yeah. of the practice in the classrooms that we saw. I, I would, you know, on a, on a less personal and more sort of, I hope, objective analysis, the data exists that shows that in the school where we have a significantly enough, large enough percentage of students who are economically disadvantaged or who have high needs, that that's where we're seeing an increase in two levels over two years. Yes. So again, for all those folks out there who are considering charge school education or school yeah. choice for their child, <laughs> yeah. even with the most challenging students, Such a good point. our elementary schools do a phenomenal job, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this data, this data comes from DESE, right? This is oh, not yeah. data that we've made. No, no. So much of the challenge with East Hampton, I continue to believe, is that, that, that people, and maybe this is curb appeal of the buildings or whatever it is, but won't look through to say, what would be the real experience of my child in this system? I mean, the achievement gaps of all students overall are level one, and the gaps between the, the school overall and the high needs and the economically disadvantaged students are are narrow and are getting narrower. Correct. Right? The yep. overall performance is going up yep. in ELA and math, uh -huh. and the gap is going down. Yes. So you really have a rising tide lifting all boats I, in the most challenging right. demographic school population that we have in East Ham. Yep. <clears throat> I, I've, I've used that metaphor quite a bit in professional development this year to, to sort of sell everyone on inclusive practices. That's true, the rising tide. I mean, it's the instructional practices that you learn through inclusive practices help all students. That's just the bottom line, yeah. Um, so some other things we've done in all of our <coughs> elementary schools, um, we have um, hired some really excellent new Title I reading recovery teachers this year. Um, they're uh, at Center and Pepin, and they're just, they're just wonderful teachers, and they're really pushing um, those kids, really, the kids are getting a double dose of literacy every day, and it's really it's good news. Um, we've also increased the number of um, teachers that we have trained at the elementary level in um, ABMR, which is the math recovery, corollary to reading recovery, um, and so that's been really strong um, in our schools as well. Um, we have a literacy coach for our elementary schools who is providing professional development in the classroom um, to teachers um, it, during their literacy blocks just really pushing their practice um, to become uh, more rigorous. Um, and as a district, we've really taken a, an approach all together in inclusive practices and social emotional behavioral skills. It's coming from you know, our leadership team is really engaged in this work. And it just seems everyone is, I mean, again, it's the rising, it's the rising tide. That's I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, and we've also expanded our Quest program, which is our Talented and Gifted program, to push those upper level kids, push more of them out of proficient into advanced. Um, and so we hadn't been including our third graders in that program for a couple of years. We've got them back in there. Um, they are meeting the expectations, and it's really, um, it's very important work. All right, so on to Whitebrook. 
So we know Whitebrook is our level three school, um, meaning that they need technical assistance. This is where I'm going to tell you what we get <laughs> for being level three. Um, we get assistance from um, a group, from a part of DESE called the um, District and School Assistance Center, DSAC. Um, and DSAC gives us both manpower and financial assistance. <coughs> So we have a number of specialists um, who are trained in both math recovery and reading recovery who work with us. Um, and we also get a, a grant um, that is supposed to help us with implement what the department refers to as turnaround practices. Um, so in uh, Whitebrook this year, we are using those turnaround practices. We're implementing um, instructional rounds, which is a, a peer observation model for gathering data about instructional practices in a school. And if I could just interject oh, yeah. here, um, that's exactly what the high school uh, right. put into place a number of years ago and, and brought them up from level that's three right. to level one. And it's even the same people who are working with us. Really? Yeah. Yeah, cool. It's great, the, um, the DSAC crew has not changed in that number of years. So we've got the same people working with us to really craft that, um, that process, yeah. Uh, so that's really great. Um, and again, I just want to emphasize about Whitebrook and our level there, I'm sure you all know this, but the elementary schools have, um, you know, pre-K pre to uh, four or K to four, depending on which one you're looking at, which means they have two tested grades. So if children are in need of interventions, we're only looking at two grades to provide those interventions. At the high school, they only have one tested grade, so providing those interventions is so easy, so you can really target in on those 10th graders. Whitebrook tests every single grade, and two of those grades have three assessments. It's just, it's massive testing. And so for all four of those grades to get the intervention assistance that they need, whether you're talking about money or people or the, just the schedule, it is very difficult to provide intervention you know, for so many students at the same time, in the same year, in the same building. Um, so I just want to emphasize that that is, that is a challenge for us, and DSAC is certainly helping us with it, but it's a challenge to have four tested grades, which is why that five to eight grade span is actually really unusual in it's, the Commonwealth. Uh, it's I usually- I was going to ask you that. So yeah. you said, again, the five to eight mm -hmm. span is very difficult for us to compare to other communities. Yes. And so this is probably one of the most really obvious difficulties of that setup. I think so, yes, absolutely. Most schools do run that K to five grade mm -hmm. span, which mm -hmm. means you have three tested grades in the elementary, three tested mm -hmm. grades in the middle school, you still have that one tested grade in high school. They also have SATs and right. AP and everything, so they're fine. So but one of the arguments then, and, and maybe mm -hmm. this is where you're going, um, Karen, is if we restructure the classes that were housed in the same building. Because the other piece of this level one, level two, level three silliness with the labeling is the, the fact that the way your students are divided up by buildings mm -hmm. can alter the number. Yeah. You could have the exact same students performing exactly the same way. Correct. So no material difference in the educational experience or performance of any child in the district, but house them differently. Yep and the levels that you would be at could conceivably be different. Yes. So we may not be able to change the system, but this is an argument for K through eight mm -hmm. in one building. We believe it is, yes. Right? I believe it is. Right, K through eight in we one building. Yes. I mean, we is gonna, I mean, yes. then when you, then when you <laughs> yes, do the average, do. the number that it's closest to is one. Yeah. And, and the design that we're talking about is having grade level clusters and sure. bringing the fifth grade back into the cluster with uh, K through four. Exactly. And there's been a lot of discussion on all our workshops. It has centered on that, especially mm -hmm. what you were just saying, the grade five, mm -hmm. going back into the elementary yeah. and section. And I think if you talk to any of the grade five teachers, you know, mm -hmm. their perception is right. these kids are still elementary school children. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are. <laughs> right. yeah. And there's no need to, to, to rush. One of the things <laughs> yeah. in, in a letter that we're going to look at later is that a number of the schools internationally that perform well. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in performing well on standardized tests, why don't you look at schools that perform well on international tests? They don't even start in some of the countries in regular school yeah. until they're set yeah. on the theory that kids have important developmental things that, that they can be experiencing 
outside formal classwork. So the, this this rush to convert people into into middle school in grade five. Yep. Um, let's see. Is there anything else there? We did. I mean, so all those things said about about Whitebrook. I do want to note that there was a lot of good news in the Whitebrook data. Again, the students were improving. We didn't see declines in our subgroups. We saw improvement in our in our growth. Um, so that's that's all fantastic news. Um, let's see. So let's talk a little bit about um, the. Well, let me okay. Let me go to the high school, and then I'm going to come back to inclusive practices. Um, so the high school level one, um, just it's just the assessment data from that tenth grade um, graduation requirement in ELA Math and Science. Um, I know that you've talked a little bit or heard a little bit about the complex tasks um, work that they're working on in their um, cycle of inquiry in their in their professional learning communities, and I think we'll you'll hear more about that um, at a future school committee meeting. Um, they've also taken a really nice whole school approach to growth mindset this year, which I think is incredibly valuable research and work. Um, to the point that they have brought in a consultant who's not only worked with um, the teachers on how to support growth mindset in the classroom and the school. Um, but the consultant also worked with the students on what it means to work smarter, not harder. Um, and that's, I think, really, really important work for them to be doing, especially um, our students who will be going off into colleges and careers. Mm -hmm. um, is this the work they did with Andrew Watson? Mm -hmm. It is Andrew Watson's right. work, yes. Thank you. <laughs> it's, well, it, it's terrific. I saw it. Yes. I had the, the good fortune to go to East Hampton High School yesterday and observe um, a classroom and, and walked away as I almost always do with an idea about how to improve my own classroom teaching and I, you can see the influence yeah. there of that that approach right well and that's I mean that what you just said is the idea around instructional rounds um, right. it's that you get more teachers into each other's classrooms I mean just in our first round of instructional rounds the teachers were saying oh I really liked that thing he was doing in his classroom I'm gonna start that tomorrow mm -hmm. I mean it's just those little pieces that really yeah everyone everyone improves so it's all all very good news yeah um, so the next slide is the the theory of action that we're sort of working with um, as we talk about um, inclusive practices and how we're going to improve um, as a district um, so this is our theory of action if we use data informed decision making to provide interventions in inclusive classrooms for our students in need of flexible tiers of support and multiple means of learning, I'm gonna explain all of this language in a second, then all students will benefit and achievement will increase. So this is sort of putting together all of the pieces so that our initiatives aren't siloed, but all together we're all working towards one goal, um, which is incredibly important from the district perspective. Um, so as started in the high school, we're using a cycle of, in a cycle of inquiry, um, meaning that we look at the data, we decide on an intervention that we want to use, we implement it, we collect data along the way as we implement it, then we look back at that data, decide what our next intervention is gonna be, and we just keep moving around the cycle so that we're continually improving, but only through that very close eye on data um, and the interventions that we put into place in the classroom. So that's something as a district, all of our schools are working on. We have um, structured professional learning communities, PLCs, in every building now, and um, the administration, the principals, um, and their teacher leaders are all working very hard to maintain that structure and have it be a useful um, time for teachers to come together um, and share their practice, but then also look at the data and decide how to improve their practice. Um, so that's our cycle of inquiry. Some of the ways that we're using DESI initiatives to help that, this is where I'm gonna talk about inclusive practices. Um, so DESI uh, last year released the Inclusive Practices Guidebook. Um, the website I've included just that screenshot there for you. Um, so you can see how many tools they've given us um, to really help with this idea of all students belong in the classroom with highly, uh, okay, they've stopped using the term highly qualified, uh, with high quality instructors um, giving high quality instruction, what do I say? Um, and so interventions are, are not meant to be a student is pulled out of the classroom during literacy and given a totally separate literacy curriculum, right? Literacy is the, um, the intervention for, for literacy is meant to be 
in keeping with the content that is happening in the general education classroom. So you're not, um, you're not separating the skills from the content. Skills have to be embedded in meaningful content in order for students to improve. And so that's how we are structuring at the elementary school, um, and, and, and Maple certainly has been um, very progressive in, this, in um, doing this structure um, of making sure that students are getting a double dose of both content and skill instruction that's embedded in what the meaningful work that they're doing in their classrooms. Um, so we, uh, as a leadership team, um, we're working with a consultant from the collaborative, Sharon Jones. She's gonna help us um, in what this means to, to get better at inclusive practices. We're already using it mostly um, around the district, but uh, a little professional development never hurt. And I think what she's doing is doing an analysis for right. us. She's looking at our classrooms and, and then she'll give us feedback on where she sees inclusive practices and, and then suggestions for how to bring them in where, where, we, where we're not seeing them. Yes. For the technical term for what she's doing is called, it's called an industry inventory. Um, and so she'll give us a comprehensive look at how we're using inclusive practices across the district. Uh, which will be really helpful in then implementing the next slide, the Massachusetts Tiered System of Support. Um, and I, I've given you some graphics there. Um, I'm gonna, just a really brief on what tiered um, support looks like. I do wanna say that it applies to both academics and behavior. So um, both our social emotional behavioral learning and our academic content and skill learning can both be approached through this um, structure of tiered systems. Mm -hmm. Tier one is where you'd find your general education students mostly. They need few supports in the classroom. Um, they can mostly access the content and the skills without more supports, without more scaffolding. Um, tier two is the interventions that happen in the classroom with the entire um, uh, student body but are a little bit more targeted. So that might be um, things like a teacher having a small group who haven't, you know, they, she's given a um, pretest, notice that there are some kids who are a little further behind than other kids on um, a particular skill. She does the whole class instruction, and then she may pull that small group of kids to give them a little extra instruction, or maybe to reteach a concept, right? But it's all happening within um, the general education classroom. Tier three is then um, generally our special education, um, or if you're looking at the social emotional skills, it might be our behavior teachers, um, really looking at what specialized instruction needs to be given to those students. Um, so that's how we're looking at sort of everything we're doing right now. Everything should be in that inclusive classroom of um, tier one learning but we're training our teachers to get better at the tier two intervention that can happen right in the classroom. And then we're improving communication and support for those tier three um, interventions that really should be happening through special education. Um, and then in the next slide, that also applies to social emotional learning. Um, again, last year, uh, the Department of Ed came out with this really nice um, package of what does social emotional learning look like? Why is it so important? How does it impact academic learning? Um, and so that's another piece that we're really looking at. You can see those five skills there. If you know any elementary school kids, think about how, they, how they're doing on those five skills. I think self-awareness is a little difficult for most of them. Self-management, hard for a lot of adults. Um, so the five articulated skills of where we really need to be supporting our students. Um, the next slide is the universal design for learning. This is a way of looking at um, making sure, we used to call it, so everything old is new again, right? We used to call this um, making sure that we were accessing multiple intelligences in our classrooms, how our gardeners work. Now we call it um, universal design for learning. It's all the same idea around kids access content and skills in lots of different ways visually, spatially, kinesthetically. We've got all of these ways that our brains work. They all work uniquely, which is extraordinary, but a teacher still has to stand in front of 20 something students and teach a lesson. So if that teacher can make sure that she is um, providing multiple means of representation, providing multiple means of action and expression, and providing multiple means of engagement, then she's going to get more kids into that lesson um, and be able to improve their um, 
their understandings. So that's a, um, a design we're also looking at. So to come back to the theory of action, all of those pieces fit into the big long sentence. We're going to use data-informed decision-making, which is our cycle of inquiry, to provide interventions in inclusive classrooms, which is guided by the work of the Inclusive Practices Guidebook, for our students in need of flexible tiers of support, which is our tiered system of support, and multiple means of learning, which is our universal design for learning. Then, all students will benefit and achievement will increase. So that's where we are as a district, <coughs> our accountability and our, our plan for the future. And if you have any questions, please definitely call me, email me. I have um, lots of time to, <laughs> I don't have lots of time. <laughs> um, but I do, as Nancy knows, I love going over the raw data. Um, and obvious. <laughs> you think? <laughs> the excitement shows. This is, okay. <laughs> this is all extremely in-depth information. Thank you. Very, very helpful. No, very, very right. helpful. I, I, I'm, I love the enthusiasm. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you can always tell them so much what they do. I do. So I do. Know what I do. Thank you. Are there, can I just ask, ask one question? Absolutely. Um, are there punitive consequences for the leveling? Only if you're um, level four or five over. Okay. So you may know about Holyoke. Yes. Yes. It is. So Holyoke went into receivership okay. after being a level five school for over three years. Okay. So yes, but we're not even close to right. that. Okay. So it is just really a matter of perception. Yeah. At this point, at this point it's, a it's definitely perception, okay. and, and we get the extra money. I don't know if Holyoke was actually in for three years. I just realized that that's. It was a number of years. It was a number of years. Yeah. Okay. So if you're a number of years so in levels four or five, years. then the. The only way to get into levels four and five is that the Board of Ed actually has to take action on the district. Okay. So that's what happened with Holyoke. They took action, went into receivership. We, right. we just don't, I mean, even for level three, we're in the 16th percentile. Mm -hmm. So we're only four percentile points away from being a level one or two school. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we okay. keep making growth. So and as we long as you're yeah. continuing to make growth. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing that's punitive. I think this is really impressive. Really, all of this information is so impressive. Oh. Well, I, I mean, our students and our teachers deserve a lot of credit, and our principals, our building principals are fantastic. Yeah. Well, and Julianne has done a wonderful job this year coming on new to the position, um, working with our teachers, working with our administrators, and I think probably Jill can attest to that. Uh, she's formed a great partnership at the middle school, and uh, they're making uh, lots of gains in lots of positive ways. And she does love to do research. When I was doing the ed plan for the, um, the building project, I wanted some research on um, class size and its impact on learning for, for students. And so I think within a few minutes, she might just pull that up for me. And we were able to plug it into the uh, That's good. plan. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank yeah. you, Julianne. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you very, very much. My pleasure. We're grateful to have you in this role. Yeah. Happy to be here. And you don't need to say. I don't need to say. Oh, she does have young children. Oh, they're excuse. I do. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh. Okay, that was great. Um, moving on to more. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you so much. And please do contact me with any questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, um, Deb, I'd like yeah. to have us. If we can. Uh, reverse the order and do the minutes and next are, are we going going to matters for action yes we are uh, and only ask that we make a note that we'll postpone actually signing a physical copy of the minutes until later I we, everybody has an electronic copy I hope we don't have to sign it for the minutes we don't we have know. to sign it oh okay I thought we just there would have be to a copy I have to sign it. The secretary has to sign the minutes. Oh, right? okay, okay. So what I, I'm just making the note in advance that if you want, we can postpone the vote on the November 29th meeting because I don't have a physical copy of the minutes. If someone does, I do. Oh, I do too. Great. Okay. 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 Sure. Terrific. That's great. Thank you. I have an electronic copy. Great. Okay. Then we're fine. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So. False alarm. Well, um, you want to, so that I would move that we approve that the I would move that we approve the minutes from November 29th, 2016. Second. 
There's been a motion to approve the minutes from November 29th, and it's been seconded. All those in favor? Motion passes. Okay, can we move to warrants and payroll? Yes. Um. Can you come sit down here? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. That would be great. Okay. You ready? Yes. You ready. sure? I'm ready. Okay. Warrants and payroll. Warrants and payroll. Here we go. Pink sheet. I got it. Okay. Uh, I move to approve this full payroll dated 8 December 2016 in the amount of $486,728.29. It's been a motion and it's been seconded to approve the school payroll dated December 8, 2016 in the amount of $486,728.29. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Uh, I move to approve the accounts payable authorization for payment dated 8 December 2016 in the amount of $291,078.00. There's been a motion and it's been seconded to approve the accounts payable authorization for payment dated December 8, 2016 in the amount of $291,078.00. All those in favor? Motion passes. Okay, next pink sheet. Those things that you want, those are the email already. Right. So I actually probably should keep them and have Deb sign them. Okay, Deb? We'll have you okay. sign these next, after. Okay. So that all goes to that and that sheet. Okay. Next up. Uh, I'm moved to approve the school payroll dated December 22nd, 2016, the amount of $496,040.69. There's been a motion and it's been seconded to approve the school payroll dated December 22nd, 2016, in the amount of $496,040.69. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Uh, I move to approve the accounts payable authorization for the payment dated 22 December 2016 in the amount of $328,091.96. Did I hear there's a second? Thank you. There's been a motion. Uh, it's been seconded to approve the accounts payable authorization for payment dated December 22nd, 2016 in the amount of $328,091.96. All those in favor? Motion passes. Right, and that will need the signatures of everyone. We then have a budget uh, transfer request uh, for salary in the map. Sorry. It's trying to be efficient. Oh, 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 actually, it's here too. I don't know why I'm doing that. Uh, okay, so the motion is to transfer, uh, it's, sorry, it's for a, um, a budget transfer request submitted by Dale Doran on the 30th of November, 2016, in the amount of $23,356, and this is to cover a new PK teacher. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion to approve. It's been seconded uh, to approve a budget transfer request to allow for a teacher's professional salary in the amount of $23,356 for a new pre-K teacher. Pre-K teacher. All those in favor? Motion passes. And there is also a motion um, from uh, dated 15 December 2016 from Alice Robello, the Center Pepin principal, regarding school choice openings. And this is a request mm -hmm. for a school choice slot, school of choice slot, to be opened in grade three at Center Pepin. Uh, there is a third grade student whose family has moved out of the district, but would like to remain in our school system. So I, I move that we approve this school of choice slot so that this third grader can remain in our school system. Second. There's a motion that's been seconded to achieve, approve the school choice opening request by Allison Ravello for grade three at Center Pepin. All those in favor? 
that motion passes. Thank you very much. And um, we are not going to adjourn. We're going to move into a We're work move session. Into a work session. And we will need additional signatures um, <coughs> on uh, the warrants that we just approved. So you need to sign these. Sign these. Actually, you know what? Can you sign these? And then I'll shepherd them along these first two. None of those have been signed in advance. All of these. probably should because it's a public meeting. And I, and I apologize. I don't like to text during a meeting, but I had a family matter that came up. Right. With regard to the work session, session, I'm just thinking it'll be incredibly boring for people, anybody watching. Right, so you signed these, Sam? No, I have not. I don't know. I just signed these. Oh, okay. So these are done. Those are done. Actually, maybe you want to let's follow. I think there was a duplicate here, Usually but we she signed does. it anyway. If she's available, she does. Do you, um, so I'm going to put everything under the pink sheet that goes together as best as I can tell. I lost track of one. I didn't look at it. No, that's okay. I think we've got, I think we've got two approvals of one, but that's fine. Better two than none. Okay. So, we got that. So those, those all go together as one packet, and they're signed and ready. This group needs additional signatures from the mayor, and yeah, we need two more signatures on each of these. Okay, and then this does have the signed, um, this is the signed copy of the minutes. Okay, thank you, I'm sorry, I, I forgot. I should always print that out. And then I, we approved this, but I don't think I have to sign it anywhere. This was a budget transfer request, but I don't believe it requires a signature. I think the vote allows it to be processed. Okay? Yes. So I think that's thank all the people. Yeah. Thank you for stepping in. Okay, so the purpose of this work session is to continue some of the work we've been doing and finalize some of the work we've been doing on the documents that we wanted to create for various purposes. And the first thing that we should probably address is the um, letter to the city council that we're presenting tomorrow. And Marissa provided final edits to that letter. I don't know if everyone's had a chance to read it or we're down to four of us. <laughs> um, but I'll start off by saying I think it looks great and I would be in favor of proceeding with it as presented. I agree. You agree. Have you had a chance to look at it, Mayor okay. Karen? Are you talking about the letter that you read earlier? I no, this, this would be the letter that we're, we're planning to um, read to the city council tomorrow night. Oh, okay. So, um, so what our plan was, Marissa provided some final edits right. for our meeting tonight, and so we just wanted to be sure that we were all in agreement. And um, actually, we were going to vote on it. I think we should vote on it. Yep. I think um, we do. We vote to have it. Right. We've alerted them that of the general sentiment. This right. specific letter approves this letter right. as an so, official voice. So I'm going to abstain from it. Just to tell you ahead of time, if you because we do think we're voting on it, I'm abstain from it because I wasn't involved in the workings of this, and I'm also already involved on the other end in Makes the sense. ordinance subcommittee. Mm -hmm. Already to meetings there, so I don't have any objections to it. But I don't feel that um, that you know I feel that I'm abstaining. Okay. okay. So does that work for a vote for us? If yes. we have one abstention and three in favor, that's okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, that's because the abstention, the abstention yeah. counts as a it's three for purposes four. of the quorum. Okay. All right, then, um, do we have a motion to approve? Yeah, motion to approve the, the letter uh, as written and for reading at tomorrow evening city council meeting. Second. All those in favor? Yes, one abstention. Very good. Thank you very much, Marissa. Appreciate that. Small, small changes. Okay. 
Um, oh, just to confirm, um, is it okay if I read this meeting tomorrow? Read, read this letter tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And is anyone else planning to attend? I'm just curious. I hope yes. to. You yes. hope to want to attend. I was just curious. Yeah, she's she not going to be yeah. there. Yeah, I hope to be there. Okay, I'm just curious. I'll be present. Okay. Cool. Um, <coughs> so thank you again, Marissa and Peter, for um, all your help with that. Okay, next we wanted to discuss um, these documents that Peter and Marissa, Peter took a first crack at, Marissa has done some additional work on. Um, so I have a procedural question before we go any further. Given how few the people are uh -huh. in the room and given that we don't face, as we did with the, the two pre private previous uh, letters, the one that we read during the formal meeting and the one that we just endorsed, both of which I think we've had more time. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is terrific. I would be happy to endorse this tonight. I've already thanked Marissa for um, making a good letter, what, what I think is a great letter. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm only interested, and I suppose we could vote on it tonight, the three of us. I would simply ask that we re-vote on it when the mayor has had time, because this is this is a letter that that doesn't involve work that the mayor has done mm -hmm. elsewhere, mm -hmm. and the other members, I would I I would encourage the the committee to to, to work for a seven zero letter, uh, a seven zero mm -hmm. vote in favor of right. the letter right. Right. Um, at our January meeting. I'm happy to vote tonight three I with an abstention, no, but that'll give you two I think it makes three. sense to have everyone on board. Right. And again, it's and terrific. The timing is not. You know, the essence here, we can take our time with this. And the, and the timeliness of this, and I realize I don't expect anyone to look at it, but I, and I forgot to let you know that it's literally three minutes, but I tried to send an email to everyone on the committee today that included a clip from this morning's uh, marketplace. Um, and, and the audio clip, I think, only runs about four or five minutes, but makes a powerful um, argument consistent with what we're trying to describe in this letter. And it suggests that I think this topic is going to remain in the forefront of people's attention. Mm -hmm. And so I think it will, you know, we won't be doing any harm by returning to it in 2017. Right. Well, one thing I wanted to ask is I had a meeting with um, my colleague superintendents last Friday at the Collaborative, mm -hmm. and I was talking to them about this, and they were very interested in seeing it. Um, and so I don't know whether you want to wait until we finalized it or just sending them a, a draft just for them to see the progress that, I, that we've made, but they were, um, they were very pleased that you all were doing this. I think we should wait till have something finalized before sharing it, don't you think? Well, I, I actually think a draft is good because, you know, a lot of times it, they're not, you know, they're not going to want a copy of verbatim anyway, but it gives them the ideas and like a lot of the bullet points. And well, th this actually be something that we could always send them a copy of yeah. our finalized too, you know, email that to them, but that could give them a little, little, uh, you know. I'd yeah. be interested to know from your experience and yours, Nancy, whether, um, like, sort of the mechanisms of really getting a bunch of people to gather behind a letter like this, like, it, does it make more sense to, to, in the same way that we did for the question two resolution where Andover gave us an example and then districts made a little bit of tweaks but adopted it independently as opposed to actually trying to gather a single document that has mm -hmm. everybody's name to it. Mm -hmm. um, very, very and that's an argument in favor of, of sharing the draft sharing because the draft. if another yeah. superintendent and school mm -hmm. committee share the same general sentiment mm -hmm. but want to emphasize a different point, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was struck this morning by that news because one of the key reference points they made when talking about the current state of, of charter schools is that they pointed to the evidence in Massachusetts and the question to vote. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, anything that we do that adds into the ideas, mm -hmm. in the end, you know, I, from my perspective, I'm interested in, in people endorsing the importance of treating public education as a community good. And, and if other folks can come up with additional or more effective ways of, of expressing it, yeah. more power to them and to us, right. and then we can always affirm our particular letter uh, in January and add to what I hope will be a chorus of people communicating with Governor Baker that he should reconsider his position. Um, and maybe the extreme nature of the current nominee for Secretary of Education would highlight 
to Governor Baker where we're headed. You know, he may have thought in, well, in Massachusetts, where, you know, most of the schools are doing pretty well and education seems to be in good shape, what would be the harm in adding 12 more schools, except that the voters said, think again. Right. Once he hears what, what uh, Secretary, uh, what do you call it, elect, uh, or Secretary designate uh, uh, for education, thinks about giving uh, money to for-profit and, uh, and, and religious schools uh, for public money, for, for education, I think he might uh, reconsider his position. Well, my experience with um, the, the charter movement and the, the uh, energy around the ballot question was that, you know, my colleagues did share pieces with me and we shared with each other, and I think in some ways that sort of gets the snowball rolling yeah. and, and gets uh, energy behind it. And there's the yeah. power of numbers. I guess, but could it, we could do all of that, but I guess yeah. what I would just I would feel more comfortable with is if we could have the larger group be in agreement. I mean, I think we're we're probably all in agreement that it would work as is. But I guess as a matter of process, I just feel more comfortable since it's not we're not under the gun with a deadline and a critical time crunch here that we have the whole group um, agree on this and that we outline a strategy and a plan who we want to share the document with. And we just outline a time, a timeline, and a plan for where it's going to go and what our strategy is. Is our strategy, you know, or maybe we have several different strategies depending on the group. But I guess I'd rather do that than release this at this time, um, kind of willy nilly. I'd really rather like map out at least for now. This is step one. This is our thinking in terms of our plan, and maybe that will be revised as things move forward. And but I guess I'd feel better about that being a little bit more. Deliberate about it? Well, I think a lot of discussion too um, would be good because what you were talking about later on, what you were talking about earlier, Kayla, you were talking about what you were talking about earlier is is very common and it does have a lot of punch. Now I know when in, uh, in the state, whenever like the they want to get the mass mayors to all sign on something, it's a document okay. and they get it to every single mayor. So and they list those. Yeah. And, and I was just looking at them. Remember uh, Chris Caputo? Because yep. um, I know I had signed on to a letter, and I think that's where he was going on that, too. You know, trying to get, like, you know, the more, so, like, what you're talking about, the collaborative and the different communities, so that might really have a little bit more strength in the end. Yeah. You know? And like uh -huh. you said, but get a plan. Of, I'd like to put together a plan mm -hmm. for what groups we want to target, mm -hmm. how, how best to target them to reach out to yeah. them. And, and I'm a little concerned, too, and I, know mm. I, I, I don't want to get off the, I'm not going to get off the issue, but I don't want to get off track, but I'm a little concerned, too, because one of, um, one of Judith's fears, um, you know, on the funding end, was if that ballot question, um, you know, had gone through, it would, it would have completely eliminated any of our chances of, you know, uh, redoing the way, you know, these funds are calculated, all of that. And, but, because I, I remember talking to um, a Stan Rosenberg, and he said, you know, that, that ballot question is really important for like, you know how we talked before, or what, you know, why are you, you know, giving the funds here, and they go there, and uh, you know, all of that. Like, obviously, it costs us a lot of money. Over a million dollars is a lot of money. Um, and he had said, well, you better hope that, you know, it's favorable for the, the ballot question because any chances of relooking at the way things are configured would be out the window. Well, okay. So now, you know, on our end, it was favorable on our end, so where's the relooking yeah. at things? That's yeah. not what I'm seeing here. Yeah. This is just kind of the opposite, yeah. right? So the voters, I mean, the voters have spoken, and then this looks like just exactly the opposite of where we were headed and why we were so, you know, you know, holding no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I'd, I'd like some strength, you know, I'd really like to, like you said, have a plan. Yeah, I'd like to strength. map out a plan and, and um, I don't think a lot will be happening in different organizations in the next two weeks anyway. We're meeting yeah, Christmas January. holiday. Yeah. And we're going to meet in January, early January. I think your point of, of making sure that everybody gets to see it. Right. Before, yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 It makes That's sense. Fine. Yeah. yeah. So, and I just, since we mentioned that, I just wanted to remind folks, and I know that I was in the room and I know that it makes sense, but a reminder that starting in 2017, we're shifting our meeting night, correct? We are. Oh, yeah. I know that. Sorry about that. Okay. Maybe I'm convincing myself of something I don't remember, but I just went back and looked at the, the announcement here that said our next meetings are the 12th 
and the 26th. Those are Thursdays in January. Oh, well, you know. I remember that we moved the meetings to 6 o'clock on I remember that too. Tuesdays. We had that conversation, Peter, because right. I thought you had a conflict on Tuesday. I did. The one? I did, but I, but I thought my don't. understanding was that the, well, I mean, I, I do, but that, you know. I thought this changing the time resolved the problem. Not only changing the time, especially when we leave it, when we finish at 7. Tonight I contributed the fact that we didn't, but I want to be able to contribute. So um, I think I, I just wanted to be sure that. Mm -hmm. I think Sue may have just put that in based on something that was said a or while ago. Right. So we may we may or need to double just. At the wrong time. Let's just double check. You know what I mean? it's right. Easy. Yeah. What, is it, that, check what is it that you um, want to do though? Well, well I, I want to know what the rest of the committee want to do because I thought everyone yeah. so far found the experiment with six o'clock to be working. It's great for it's me. Fine. And the Tuesday nights right. really work well for me because I always think of those as well. Is that right. it's the six so the six is working for you as well? It's fine. But the, right. the night for you right. to, for everybody too, the, the Tuesday? Right. I moved Tuesday my Tuesday. I got my I got my okay. dorm my my dorm duty switched to Wednesday nights. <laughs> I still have something on Tuesday nights, but I can you know, there may be a couple of Tuesdays when I leave it. Seven. Let's but I, uh, I just wanted to check because I was looking at this and I thought, okay, we moved it to the, the Thursday. I think they are too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Even it's easy to look at the wrong calendar. She could yeah. have been looking at 2016. Exactly. So it is so okay. easy to look at. January keep 16. the meeting on Tuesday at six o'clock. Yes. So, so I'll confirm that. So would you ask Sue to just send out a message? Yeah. Um, with regard to confirming when our first yeah. meeting is in the new year. That'd be great. Date and time. Yeah. So, okay, just to yes. back up a little in bit point, too. In point, in fact, in January of this current year, Tuesday was the 12th and the 26th. So I suspect so that it was just a calendar issue. false alarm, but we, we should get it corrected in the public record so that people know when we're going to meet. Yeah, right? yeah we're, we're meeting the 10th. We're meeting the 10th and the, the, and the 17th, calendar. correct? Perfect. And nothing on the 17th? I lied, not the 17th. 24th. 10th and the 24th, right? Yeah, that's not on there. Right now, they just said the meeting. Okay. 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 So our our two main um, topics for the work session were the letter to the city council, finalizing that, and these letters. Which, just to confirm a recap, we're we're both in agreement that we like them as they are. I think we're. I think. Ahead. Yeah. I, mean, I think we're in good good shape. I think they're they're, they're terrific. <laughs> Thank you. And um, and we'll pick up that conversation. Let's let's also plan to add a work session tacked on to the next meeting, so that we can. Continue that discussion about these letters and a, and a action plan. Okay, that sounds good. And does that cover everything? Well, I guess I just have a quick question, and, and I feel bad asking it. So I know that there's four of them. You might have duplicate copies. No, hopefully. Oh no, I know what you've got. There's three letters and there's a cover letter for one of them. So the, le the letter that we're addressing, right, we've got one letter is, one letter is done and is going to be presented tomorrow night. That's the letter on the marijuana, marijuana, marijuana regulation. The city right, going to the right. city council. Another letter was the reaffirmation statement that we made tonight exactly. in the meeting. Now that's right. And okay. then there's two documents related to the third letter. There's exactly. the, the revised draft of the letter itself, and this is the introduction of Perfect. what we're doing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. It's a lot of letters yeah. this time. All good ones. Okay, so I think we've covered everything we need to cover for this evening. All right. All right. So do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Now I'm in.